Today, as part of our Native Australian Animal Series, the Veterinary Student Information Network would like to bring to you the Echidna, a unique and beautiful Australian native animal. Of the two remaining extant genera of the Echidna, we have Zaglossus in Papua New Guinea, which is a long-beaked Echidna, and we have the Tachyglossus in Australia, which is the short-beaked Echidna, widespread across Australia in a variety of environments, from desert to forest to urban. So our Tachyglossus aculeatus translates as a quick tongue with spines, which is a pretty accurate description of our little friend. It's also a monotreme, one of two monotremes, the platypus and echidna in Australia, which means one orifice, aka it's a cloaca, um, which is used for defecation, urination and reproduction. Now this little egg-laying mammal it was a pretty unique discovery. Back in 1884, when they found the first egg specimen, the first European scientist to discover it actually managed to squash the specimen in his hands because he wasn't actually prepared for the fragility of the egg. Um, the echidna egg is about 1.5 to 2 grams. It's about the size of a 5 cent coin in Australia, um, which is why it's emblematic on the coin. And we're going to go into the life cycle starting with this little egg. So basically the female echidna lays an egg um, into a pouch that can, she constructs out of a really strong muscle layer that coats her entire body. She actually just creates a temporary pouch. Um, the egg's in there for about 10 days before it hatches and the little puggle uses a little egg tooth to actually poke its way through this soft-shelled egg. The egg tooth actually falls off. So we have the little puggle hatching and it manages to feed from a milk patch um, rather than a teat. So we can't use a teat to identify a female echidna. In fact, they're really tricky to differentiate between the two genders. Um, so one of the things that the echidna does is just, yeah, it manages to lick milk off the, the patch on the underside of the female echidna. After about a month of incubation in the pouch, um, the echidna little puggle starts to grow its own spines. So at this point, the mother actually makes a den for it where she leaves it, returning only every four to six days for a feed, while the little puggle grows itself and grows its own spines. When the echidna, the puggle has grown to full age, after about five months in the den, um, the mother will actually return for her last visit, feed it, and basically leave the den open instead of backfilling it like she normally does. Um, so and that's about the most interaction they have. From then on, they lead pretty solitary lives. And uh, when the, the female echidna reaches about five years of age, she becomes sexually active. Um, and breeding season in July, August is when you actually see echidnas being semi-social, where up to 10 males will actually follow a female echidna around in what's called an echidna train. Um, and after a successful mating a few weeks later, a single egg will be produced and the cycle continues. Now that you're familiar with the life cycle of the short-beaked echidna, let's get into some interesting facts about the echidna. The entire body of an echidna is surrounded by a thick muscular layer called a paniculus carnosus, which the mother actually uses to form the temporary pouch for her puggle in the early stages of development. The spines are embedded in this thick muscle layer. The echidna is not able to dislodge these spines to fire at any enemy. However, when they do perceive a threat, they either roll into a ball um, in an attempt to deflect that danger and protect their vulnerable underside, or they can actually just dig quite, like, quite quickly into the dirt, um, again, to just protect that vulnerable underside. The spines are also thought to serve as a thermoregulatory de device uh, to increase surface area and promote heat loss. One of the most interesting things about the echidna is how it actually procures its food. The echidna doesn't actually have a beak that opens to bite onto objects or prey. The echidna relies on its tongue, a feature that's bald at the back of its beak and can protrude up to 18 centimetres from the end of its beak, up to 100 times per minute. It does this in order to get food such as ants, termites, grubs, basically anything that fits into the tiny little 5mm opening at the end of its beak. The tongue has features such as a mucus layer on top and backwards facing spikes that help the food actually adhere to the tongue when it's withdrawn into the mouth. In some instances, the echidna can actually just sit on a non-aggressive ant nest, leave its tongue out until ants walk over it and then withdraw it into its mouth. 
With almost half of the sensory area in the brain being devoted to the snout and tongue, it's no wonder that the echidna has amazing sensors that allow it to detect prey. Not only does it rely on its enhanced olfactory sensors, it has the ability to detect electrical impulses from prey in order to locate them. What a sensational animal. Now, it would be remiss of me not to mention that which has gained the echidna infamy in the scientific community. Echidna males and females are indistinguishable externally, but inside, things really get interesting. The male penis is about 25% of body length and is renowned for having four heads. During ejaculation, however, the echidna only fires from two heads on one side. Why? No idea. But nature's complement is the female with two vaginas. Only one side will have the egg for fertilisation, and it's the luck of the drawer as to whether the male has fired into the matching side for that mating. Now hold on a minute, you ask. How on earth is any of this happening with all those spines in the way? Well, the male at the front of the train of the males basically wiggles his soft abdomen under the females to enable procreation. It's a very delicate business. In conclusion, we'll look at when you might encounter this species in a veterinary setting. Commonly, well-meaning individuals can bring in uninjured echidnas because they found them near a road or in an urban environment. However, it is against the law to relocate uninjured echidnas, and these animals have quite specific home ranges, within which a female may have a puggle buried, for example. Urban echidnas are often thriving echidnas with rich garden food sources at their disposal and little competition, but this does bring them closer to cars and dogs. Most commonly, echidnas come into veterinary practices having suffered trauma as a result of being hit by a vehicle and occasionally after a dog attack. It is important to complete a thorough examination, especially of its beak, a sensitive and vital structure for the echidna's survival. If the echidna is healthy, then it should be returned to within 50 metres of the location where it was found. If minor injuries that will not impact future survival in the wild are detected, echidnas can be placed in short-term care until they are able to be released to their original home range. However, a common traumatic injury vets encounter is a fractured beak. Unfortunately, the swelling and any hemorrhage often compresses the delicate nerve organs and pathways in the beak, causing the animal to lose its ability to detect prey. Sadly, this would result in the echidna starving to death over a prolonged period, and often the kindest outcome is euthanasia. And that concludes our information session on the echidna, although there's plenty more to learn about this and other fabulous Australian wildlife. Happy studying!